So thank you very much. Um, first, let me thank uh, uh, Marlen um, and GW for the kind invitation here today uh, to talk a bit about um, uh, to talk about a really fantastic day. I mean, it was great when I saw the agenda for the panel for this whole day. I realized there's lots of people who whose work I read constantly, and so it's great to actually be in a room and hear people's thoughts firsthand. Um, what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do today, was basically present some of the research we've been doing. Um, and we're going to do this presentation with myself and my colleague Sarah, who's sitting down there. Um, and what I'll do is I'll sort of keep the slides moving along, and we thought we'd kind of do a comparative China-Russia look at Central Asia because it really kind of taps into a lot of the research which we've been doing from the ground. So first I thought I'd give you a brief, uh, brief overview of some of the work that we're doing at RUSI at the moment. RUSI, um, the Royal United Services Institute, is, uh, well, we state this and no one's disputed yet, the oldest security and political think tank, a military think tank in the world, dates back to 1831. Um, and our research looks at sort of geopolitical and security questions in lots of different directions. The particular department that I run is our International Security Studies Department, and looking at kind of Eurasia and Eurasian dynamics, and in particular what's happening in terms of the changing Russian and Chinese approaches to the kind of heart of Eurasia is at the core of a lot of the work that we do. Um, and in the moment we're in the middle of, we're just concluding a big project looking at Chinese Eurasian pivot, uh, which has looked sort of across the Central and South Asian region and understanding kind of how China's dynamic is changing what's happening on the ground there. Uh, we're doing a much more policy oriented project looking at the Chinese and Indian cooperative relationship in Afghanistan. We're doing a lot of work looking at counting violent extremism in Central Asia. We've been working with the Georgian government um, as part of their Tbilisi Silk Road Forum that they sort of inaugurated last year and that they, they want to become a sort of regular forum. We're trying to help them figure out well, how does that practically translate into useful policy sort of activity. Um, and then as a European think tank, we're looking at trying to understand this Silk Road as something that we understand starts in Xinjiang and ends in Europe. And so trying to see how Europe can connect to this Silk Road project kind of along the way. And then kind of two big ideas which we're working on at the moment, which we haven't quite figured out what we're going to do with. One is looking at Iran's sort of look eastward, so how the opening up of Iran is going to change these dynamics, and also understanding Russia's sort of changing foreign policy towards the region. And as a sort of final plug for our work, I'll say that you can find a lot of what we've written or are writing on these subjects on a website which we run called China in Central Asia, which is one that I... Um, I found it with a, with a very dear friend, uh, Dr. Alexandros Peterson, who was sadly killed, who I think some of you um, may know. Um, but we try to keep his sort of memory alive in our work. Um, and it's a, a substantial, you know, there's a, web, there's a page on that site that's dedicated to it. I'm endlessly appreciative that uh, Marlene organized a wonderful uh, event for him um, after he sadly passed away a couple of years ago. So anyway, giving you kind of the background of where we're coming from and where, how, what sort of informs our research, the way we thought we'd structure this presentation was to look at Russia and China's roles as we kind of understand them in Central Asia, looking at through a political, a security, and economic lens. Um, and so we'll quickly do a slide on kind of each from a Russian and Chinese perspective. Um, and I'll hand it straight over to Sarah to walk us through kind of Russia's political role um, in Central Asia. Thank you, Rafael. Um, yeah, I'll stay here just because vision of labor of slide management is uh, <laughs> crucial. Um, so just to, to touch on Russia's political role in Central Asia, well, that was obviously no surprise, I think, some of the things I'm about to say, but um, in comparison to China, obviously Russia's political influence is a lot more uh, overt, and I think Russia uh, has no problem in stating its interests in Central Asia, um, particularly highlighted by Medvedev's speech in 2008 that declared Russia's intention to preserve its spheres of, of privileged influence, which would include Central Asia. Um, and apart from genuine historical, political, economic ties, uh, there does seem to be sort of a former Soviet pattern of, of Russia's use of, of economic and political leverage also in its relationships with, with former Soviet states, particularly the countries of Central Asia. And I don't think Russia sees it as just a, one region. It obviously differentiates um, its partnerships with, with each of the individual five states. But I think ultimately it is more than China looking for, for maintenance of loyalty to Russia um, and being countries that it can depend on. Um, and I'll talk a bit later in the economic section on the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, also, I think you're looking at the multilateral projects um, that Russia is a part of, uh, which some of which include China, but the SCO, CSTO, CIS. Um, I think this also is a way for Russia to use its partnerships with particularly Central Asian states to legitimize its role um, as an equivalent to countries like the US in terms of CSTO being an equivalent in principle to NATO um, and Eurasian Economic Union you know, modeling itself on, on the European Union. Um, 
so I think this this is a, a legitimization of Russia's having this alternative uh, multipolar world that really does exist. <coughs> but I think politically, post Ukraine, um, it has caused some concern, obviously, in Central Asia and China as well. I think in its relations <coughs> with with Russia. Um, this idea of sort of preventing color revolutions, which was enshrined in Russia's military doctrine update, um, as seeing as, as this is a, an internal military threat to Russia, I think also stands across the region. And this idea that, that you know, Russia now has a mandate to protect Russian speakers and ethnic Russians abroad obviously caused great concern, particularly in Kazakhstan. Um, and Putin's speech praising Nazarbayev, but also simultaneously saying that he created the Kazakh state and, and realized the value of being part of the greater Russian world, um, demonstrates the way that Russia engages, I think, is this kind of uh, leveraging position um, that, that has caused, I think, concern among Central Asian states. But that's not to say that these Central Asian states are passive in their relationship with Russia. It's not just a you know, historical Soviet uh, patron sort of position. You've seen in response to things like Ukraine, um, in, in small, subtle ways as much as they can, political freedom of, of action in terms of, uh, for example, the UN uh, vote on Crimea, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, probably one of two of the most independent of the five states. Uh, abstaining from the vote, um, also Kazakhstan making statements about the Eurasian Economic Union, not wanting it to have political elements, and the fact that it would leave if it stopped being in Kazakhstan's interest to be a member. So you are seeing, you know, the multi-vector dimension manifesting itself in in a way that these these states can speak out. I think against Russia's political dominance. Um, also, I think the the fundamental draw between between Russia and many of the Central Asian states is that. They do tend to, I think, agree on political stability, um, which, is so in some ways, you know, the Central Asian states are also in line on this uh, adversity to regime change or abrupt regime change, revolutions, color revolutions. So that's to say that many of the Central Asian states, they're not like Ukraine, they're not like Georgia. They don't um, sort of. There isn't that popular will necessarily to change the government in a way that could cause instability. And that, that contrasts maybe slightly with the Chinese view of political stability, but I think fundamentally um, they all agree on that. Um, so that's just some thoughts on Russia. I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Um, and then to look instead, sort of from a Chinese perspective, a China's sort of political role um, in the region. In some ways, this is a sort of fascinating one, which is I think one which China hasn't quite flexed yet. You know, I think that if you look at kind of what the Chinese are doing in political terms on the ground in Central Asia, it's something that it's something that there's a great sense of okay, this could happen, but it hasn't quite happened yet. But there are lots of sort of interesting indicators around this. I think the first thing, which is fascinating for me, sort of thinking about Chinese foreign policy more broadly, is thinking of Central Asia as kind of a testing ground for Chinese foreign policy efforts, right? In terms of a place where they sort of test out things, which then you maybe see reflect in other ways. And in many ways, the kind of Belt and Road vision is an archetypal example of this. You know, if we think back to when Nazarbayev, when uh, Xi Jinping started talking about this, it was in 2013 in Astana um, at Nazarbayev University where he first announced this sort of Belt and Road. Um, it was followed, you know, that was the Silk Road Economic Belt, and then soon afterwards in Indonesia he talked about the maritime, um, uh, the 21st century maritime Silk Road. Um, you know, lots of people made jokes about the fact that, you know, well, isn't that one across the seas? And roads don't usually go through seas, do they? But um, anyway. Um, but uh, the, the idea was that this is one which essentially kind of built on something which had been happening in terms of Chinese influence in Central Asia for a long time, which is the idea of building a sort of economic and trade corridor through the region, uh, building infrastructure, using sort of linked loans um, for your own domestic companies to go out and sort of build stuff on the ground in Central Asia. Um, and this was something that had been happening for the past 10 or 15 years. And so Xi Jinping coming into power and sort of stamping his name and authority onto it and then expanding it out into this kind of Belt and Road vision was, I think, an example of something that was already going on there suddenly being transposed into lots of other contexts. Um, and so I think in some ways to think of Central Asia as a testing ground for Chinese foreign policy. And you can see this in other ways as well, if you think about the Shanghai Corporation Organization, the first sort of multilateral uh, security vehicle that we see China being involved in. Again, it's one that they tried out in Central Asia and is slowly sort of uh, expanding out. I think this question of, uh, you know, and this is an important comparator in some ways between the Chinese political role and the Russian political role in the region, is Russia sees as a sphere of influence, whereas for China it's much more about domestic concerns. It's much more about st stability and development in Xinjiang, um, the westernmost province, and the sort of trade links that need to come up from that into Central Asia and having an impact, and ultimately having an impact back home. Which, of course, isn't really about sphere of influence. They don't necessarily care 
if the local sort of authorities, you know, have a, a strong good feeling towards them, it's better for business often if they do, but it's not in this Russian sense of ownership over this uh, part of the world. The question which I think, as I, as I said at the outset, is difficult to know here, is, is, is this question of has this economic role started to have a political expression? And we've seen some small indicators of this. You know, if you look at sort of Kyrgyzstan and you look at some of the situations where we've had businessmen getting, uh, getting uh, uh, you know, killed uh, by sort of local corrupt officials uh, when they sort of fail to pay up their bribes and the sort of Chinese embassy demanding that the sort of Kyrgyz authority send someone over to the embassy to apologize. You know, we're seeing that kind of aspect happening, but for the most part, it's still kind of is sitting in a non-interference mode. You know, there is still a desire by Beijing to say, okay, we're putting this economic investment in, but we don't want to have ownership. It's something that, you know, I, I have written in, in an article somewhere about, I, I characterize as kind of their inadvertent empire. They're becoming the most consequential player on the ground before sort of economics and investment there, but they don't want to sort of have the responsibility to actually have to resolve some of the local political issues that they're kind of walking into. And I'd argue that the sort of interesting case study to look as a precursor of this is to look at Pakistan in particular, and to look at some of the recent issues that they've had around the China-Pakistan economic corridor, um, and the fact that you're seeing locals sort of starting to quibble about where it is this route is supposed to go, and say, why don't you come to my little piece of Pakistan, because of course then I'll get the investment and it'll be a benefit to me, and the Chinese going, you know what, we don't really care where it goes. <laughs> We're going to build a road that will go through the country that will start in Kashgar and end in Karachi or Gwadar, um, and that's kind of the thrust. And, you know, the local political concerns that it might rile up are things that we don't quite know what to do or how to sort of handle. You know, and, and earlier this year we saw this, you know, be, be sort of uh, be made into life when the Chinese embassy in Islamabad actually had put out a statement uh, in which they said, you know, look, CPEC is a big project, it's something which is for the benefit of the entire country. Uh, local domestic politics are that your guys concerned, nothing to do with us. But it does raise a question which if you then look at Central Asia and think of how quarrelsome some of the domestic politics are within the countries and between the countries, it makes you think about how is it that the Chinese are actually going to address that. Switch over to the economic side. Um, yeah, just following on from the, the politics, I think the, the economic role of Russia in Central Asia also, you know, apart from again, uh, desiring real integration and I think economic, stronger economic ties, it is again a way to, to extract political leverage and I think one of the best examples of this was sort of the carrot and the stick um, approach sometimes for Russia was towards Bakiev in 2010 particularly, um, pre, prior to that 2009 with the potential closure of the Manas airbase which, uh, which was a US airbase at the time. Russia, supposedly from Russian pressure, um, offered a huge aid package to Kyrgyzstan the minute they announced this. When Bakiev went back on his offer, um, the soft power offensive from Russia was quite strong in terms of you know, corruption stories coming out in Russian press about Bakiev. Um, so it goes to show that you know, Russia is willing to punish uh, Central Asian countries that don't, um, and it's not you know, it's exclusive to Central Asian countries, but uh, when they potentially act politically in a way that they, they don't agree with. Um, and I think you've seen this also in, in certain other pressure points uh, from Russia economically, migrant workers particularly um, in January 2015 with the new stricter rules about migrant workers um, coming into Russia, it particularly affected Tajik workers, the, the difficulty in getting all of the approvals, the Russian language tests, history tests, the increasing costs. Many interpreted this as pressure on Tajikistan to join the Eurasian Economic Union, which would mean that they no longer have to have to go by these rules. Um, there's an over tendency possibly to analyse everything Russia does as leverage, which I don't think is fair to Russia. But um, these are things that you know uh, can be interpreted in that way and are often used specifically in that way. But I think it's quite interesting that you know these sort of pressure points, economically particularly. Russia's uh, power on, on, on that front is almost waning slightly. Remittances have dropped dramatically uh, to Central Asia, and some, but not huge, flows of migrants are returning. So therefore, Russia's ability to turn on and off that tap might, might see more limitations in the future. And then just briefly to talk about the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, I think, you know, in, in principle, it's a positive thing, further in economic integration, but um, again, it shows probably more uh, a, a, an example of Russia's desire to exert influence rather than actually think through the integration process. Um, economically, it doesn't seem to be working very well in the first three months of 2015. Inter-member trade actually dropped, so, um, and I think that's partly obviously to do with the fact that Ukraine uh, didn't join, will not join, 
um, which makes Russia's economy so dominant in, in the Union that um, you're seeing a lot of actual more bilateral trade with Russia and the other members not into trade between, between the rest of the, the Union. Um, and it just means that the Russian economy means that uh, other Central Asian countries aren't, oh, econo economies are not as competitive. And um, you've seen protectionist measures come back in from Kazakhstan on oil embargoes from, from Russia. So I think, in principle, you know, the idea works in terms of economic integration, but in, in actual fact, um, it hasn't really worked so far. And you're hearing lots of complaints from Kyrgyzstan about um, the fact that it's not benefiting them at all. Um, obviously, that's also in Kyrgyzstan's interest to extract more economic incentives from Russia. Um, but fundamentally, the question becomes, with these economic ties, what are the real benefits and who is benefiting? And it seems a lot of this is, is Russia. Um, and then just quickly to touch on um, this comparison with China. China's obvious that the economic influence in Central Asia um, has always existed, but has increased immensely to the point that China is now the biggest trade partner of the region, as opposed to Russia, showing how much, I think, China is overtaking. Um, and you're seeing some economic projects, I think, um, in recognition of this, directed by Russia, actually becoming almost subsumed in the Silk Road economic belt. So the fact that, after being quite cautious, Russia decided to endorse um, the Silk Road economic belt from the Eurasian Economic Union perspective and, and to speak about how they can integrate the project, I would agree with Alex Cooley that they're not integratable. Um, but this, this means that fundamentally Russia is admitting the Eurasian Economic Union could become part of this Chinese bigger foreign policy project. Um, so I think you're seeing recognition certainly from Russia that its economic influence is waning. Um, and that fundamentally means that, that that loss of leverage from Russia potentially is going to drop. And you're seeing um, you know, cancellation of projects that Russia had agreed to fund, the, uh, the hydropower projects in Kyrgyzstan, um, as a, a means of kind of admitting that Russia's not going to always be that reliable and economic partner, potentially in comparison or in contrast from the Central Asian perspective uh, to China. I'm conscious that uh, she was waving a five-minute flag at me. I will uh, accelerate through these uh, next few slides, maybe to distill it down to a couple of reactions, looking at the economic role, um, to really kind of talk about three particular points. One is this question of um, the domestic slowdown, which is, I think, the big question everyone has when you're thinking about the Silk Road economic belt in Central Asia. And, you know, I think there are some indicators which are sort of concerning you know, about whether this is actually going to realize. If we look at Nazarbayev's recent speeches, which is quite directly pointed to his domestic economic problems as being linked to the Russian and Chinese slowdown, if we look at the fact that Turkmenistan um, and the sort of gas that Turkmenistan was going to be selling to China, that is going down. We're seeing line D supposedly being stopped or suspended temporarily. Um, I think that speaks to the fact that there is no demand at the moment in, or there is a lessening, softening demand in China, which means that there isn't such a need for this sort of gas, which I think partially helps explain this current, you know, activity or talk that we're seeing around TAPI uh, recently. It's very much about Turkmenistan trying to think, okay, well, <laughs> that one's not going to work. We need to get another route to get our sort of product um, out to some sort of a market and get some money in. Um, and then, of course, in, in Xinjiang proper, um, we saw that uh, they were closing uh, some steel mills recently um, out in the region, and we've seen other indicators out in the province that economic, uh, the economic sort of takeoff there isn't necessarily going at sort of full pelt, and of course that will have ramifications um, across the border. But I think the thing to remember when you're thinking about the Belt and Road um, and thinking about the sort of economic slowdown at home is that in many ways, from a Chinese perspective, this is part of the answer to the domestic closure. You know, if you've got a sort of market at home that's slowing down and you've got companies, construction, infrastructure ones that might go out of business because at home there isn't, there are less things to build at the moment. Well, keeping that moving by sending it abroad is, of course, going to be a big part of your kind of solution to deal with the problems at home, which suggests to me that while, you know, there may be some negative indicators on the ground from a Chinese perspective, policy perspective, it's really important to keep this moving. And this, in some ways, is trying to answer the problems that you're seeing um, at home. Um, and then the final point which I'll pick up, which was very much picking up on um, Alex Cooley's point, was this question of, you know, will this, uh, when will this debt get collected? Uh, you know, is, if you're giving all these massive loans to these countries, is it just going to be written off? Well, I would argue that, you know, first of all, the Chinese have a much longer timeline <laughs> than the rest of us in terms of collecting these loans, and I think they're willing to be patient about it. But then the other thing is to remember how these deals are actually structured in a lot of cases. If you look at the Central Asian context, in a lot of cases, the deal was structured in such a way that, you know, XM Bank was giving the loan to the Tajik government to implement a series of projects that were going to be implemented by Chinese companies. And it's in the contract that it's a Chinese company. So the money never actually really left Beijing. <laughs> you know, it sort of shifted from one building to another building, and then a team of Chinese workers built a road somewhere in Tajikistan, right? And so this question of what we're actually seeing in these terms of loans, I think, is, 
is, a, is an interesting and important one. On the security side, um, given that we're at the five minute line, I think we will um, uh, accelerate slightly through it. I'll, I'll sort of skip over to say that yeah, I think we're going to touch on the Russia one a little bit later. Um, on the Chinese side, I think that the Chinese are, the story of the past year or so has been the Chinese increasing their security activity in the region in terms of um, in terms of particular Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, in terms of trading stuff that they're doing on the ground. Um, the other countries, it seems to still be sort of big arms sales. But, you know, I don't think it's something that uh, we've seen take off beyond that. It has sort of remained at a relative plateau. And I think the Chinese will continue to say that, you know, the Russians are the primary security guarantors in the region. We will do our little bit. And it's very much focused around kind of borders. Um, and the SCO is a vehicle that continues to be a kind of big multilateral engagement vehicle. But at the end of the day, they do a lot of their serious business at a bilateral level. Um, and then finally, to sort of conclude, and I apologize, Sarah, because I pulled those over some of your points, but maybe you can pick them up in the, in the Q&A. Um, I would say that, you know, the interesting aspect that, uh, that seems to leap out when you're looking at China and Russia in Central Asia is that while we could see the potential for, you know, conflict there, it does seem to be that I think that there are overriding geopolitical dynamics between China and Russia that mean that they will want to stay sort of aligned. I think when they're looking at some of the security questions in the region and looking at questions around stability, um, they kind of agree. And they agree with the Central Asians. There is a kind of consensus there on what that needs to be done, on how that needs to be done, and sort of how you should push it forwards. There is, I think, a genuine sense of mutual respect um, that they have between each other. Certainly every Chinese uh, expert or official I've spoken to has said to me, you know, we never do anything in Central Asia without, you know, consulting or making sure our Russian brothers were on board. At the same time, as I said, the Russians are really hard people to work with, and we don't like dealing with them, and it's really complicated and awkward. Um, but there is still this kind of, uh, this agreement there. This question of China dominating on the economics and Russia on the security side, um, there is a question about whether that's sort of changing. But again, I think I go back to my earlier point about China. I don't think wants to take the responsibility for security in Central Asia quite yet. I think it wants to remain in a position where it can guarantee its own particular interests and have a sort of role. But you know, if the Russians are the ones who want to have all the heavy metal and do all this, you know, posturing on the ground, well, fine, crack on, let them do it. You know, we don't need to get kind of involved in that because, frankly, they will uh, take care of business. And, and then the, the sort of final points about when might Russia and China actually clash in Central Asia. Um, I, it's, it's very difficult to sort of conceptualize going forwards, I think, because there is still this sort of fundamental interest and geopolitical alignment that the two of them have, which means that they will always make sure that they have some sort of a, agreement and understanding about what they're actually doing on the ground. And I will leave it at that, and thank you all very much.